And uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so hello everybody. And so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, low cost uh, emission reverse engineering. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit of background about uh, the problem I'm trying to solve, and then I'll explain what this kind of mouthful uh, means. So basically, the uh, the issue is: have, Has this ever happened to you? You go to this talk, and you're like, "Oh, squiggles! Like, what, what's what's all this stuff going on here?" So like, I don't I don't have time to like figure out what all these transistors are and all these connections. So maybe do you have too much time on your hands, sir? <laughs> but. What if I told you that there was uh, a way to see the data? That is, you know, instead of uh, figuring out all these transistors, the connections between them, uh, instead, you could actually see the data flowing and then, you know, do some analysis to say, if I change this, that this happens. And then you wouldn't have to figure out, you know, how the transistors actually worked. You would just see them work. And that's going to be what the focus of this talk is. So, with that... Uh, how, how might we do this? So one, there's several ways you can do this, and one of them is doing uh, infrared uh, emission analysis. And the way this basically works is that in certain modes of a transistor, uh, they emit uh, infrared light as the transistor is active. And that's roughly around 1,100 nanometers, depending on specific transistor properties. And uh, so what we can do is if we take a camera and a microscope setup that's specially sensitive to this, we actually can see the emission. So, you know, this is an example right here where I've taken a 7805 uh, voltage regulator and I've overlaid uh, some of the current flowing through it as it's uh, switching. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of existing, I shouldn't say a lot, there's a small amount of existing work in this area. Uh, for example, this paper right here, Security, the IC Backside. Uh, there's a related paper that's quite fascinating where they did some emission analysis uh, and actually broke AES encryption algorithms by basically photographing the uh, the S-boxes as they operated. And so I thought this was pretty cool, uh, but it seems like it's kind of an underutilized uh, field. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about that, and I'll explain a little bit later what kind of my high-level goals were uh, to kind of add to this field. So with that, uh, how would you do this professionally? Because a lot of these sort of reverse engineering techniques are based on these professional failure analysis labs. And this is an example of what one of these professional uh, machines from Hamamatsu uh, looks like. And basically what there is in this particular machine, I believe, or at least in the line, is uh, most camera sensors are made of silicon. Like, almost universally, when you hear semiconductors, you associate that with silicon. But instead of silicon, they're using a fairly exotic semiconductor called uh, ingas, that is indium gallium arsenide. And uh, because they want to get super sensitive measurements, you know, because there's not a light, a lot of light that's emitted, what they'll actually do is they'll liquid nitrogen cool it to get the get the uh, the noise from the thermal uh, down really, really low. So, and then you have to put it in this big cabinet, which we'll talk a little bit about later. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty involved setup. Uh, but there's also a few other alternative options. Uh, so, namely, you can get these uh, sensors called back illuminated. Uh, CMOS sensors, which you might see in a DSLR, I think these days, or something like that, um, which are fairly sensitive, and uh, we'll even talk about back thinning a little bit later. And the other option is you can get these things called uh, cooled CCDs. And it's not quite liquid nitrogen cooling, but uh, it also uh, lowers the noise that you get, uh, you know, as you, as you try to use these sensors. You know, and so instead of getting, you know, maybe pixel values of 1, 3, 7, 9, you know, you'll just get 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Uh, and so that helps you to get better data. Uh, so how would you actually go about doing this in practice? So there's, um, I found that basically the easiest options uh, were to get, this is a, from TubeTech. It's a, um, it's a, um, a back illuminated a CMOS sensor intended for microscopes. Uh, the one small modification I had to do though was uh, I had to remove this infrared light filter. So usually infrared light is considered kind of a pollution that, that kind of destroys your data. Uh, but in this case, I, that was actually what I was going for. So I had to remove that. And that was pretty easy just to pop this cover off and, and take out the filter there. Uh, the other option are there are a number of these astronomy uh, cooled CCDs on the market. So I was able to find these. The only problem is if you look over here, this is kind of a telescope mount. And it wasn't really well, well suited for microscopes. So I 3D printed an adapter and was able to put that on my microscope. However, uh, this camera is a little bit older than this one. 
And uh, so it's USB 2 versus USB 3. The software was a little bit harder to use. Uh, so just for practical reasons such as frame rate and easier to use software, for the majority of the talk, I used this camera. Although I, may, I believe that from a pure sensor perspective, this is actually a, a nicer camera. And I may use it heavier uh, as I do more work. Uh, so the question is, uh, these cameras, though, were not really designed for what I'm doing. Most cameras are designed for, for you know, visible uh, wavelengths, which, you know, let's, let's say roughly is in the 400 nanometer uh, to, I don't know, some, somewhere around here. And you can see, you know, we got efficiency up to 40% uh, percent there. Now, the emissions, if you remember, as I said, I'm looking for are closer to 1100. Now, that is so far out of what this was designed for, they don't even show it on their chart. Uh, so the efficiency is a bit low, uh, but it turns out to be enough that it's usable. So, and we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit. Uh, so does this work? And that was the first question I'd ask because I was a little bit scared when I saw those graphs and I was like, ugh, you know, not, not necessarily going to work well. So I got a few different, uh, infrared LEDs, namely one that's roughly around a 1060 nanometer and another one that's roughly around 1200 nanometer and pointed at, at the different cameras. And what you're actually seeing is in a normal microscope image, uh, you are using maybe like a halogen lamp or LED, uh, you know, luminaires and a shining light on the sample and taking an image. In this case, I've actually put current through the LED and you're actually looking at the LED itself, lighting itself up for the image. So this is the 1060 nanometer one here and this is the 1200 nanometer here. And I was pretty happy with the results. It didn't take a lot of current to get a microscope image at pretty reasonable capture settings. So I think that that, um, that uh, put down a lot of risk on the project with a pretty easy test. And this also allowed me to do a lot of microscope uh, testing. There were some concerns over, you know, is this, is this beam splitter, you know, going to uh, filter out infrared light due to coatings or something like that? Because these microscopes were really not designed to operate this far uh, out of the visible spectrum. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, so, yeah, I guess actually maybe now. So, um, uh, the next thing I want to do was there's a lot of issues with ambient room lighting. Because, because the light levels I'm looking for are so small, I, I have to get rid of all of this that you would normally have in the room and make sure it doesn't shine on the microscope. So the first thing is, uh, here is like an infrared, uh, cut filter. So this is the thing I mentioned earlier that would normally take out the light, uh, the infrared light from your microscope path. Uh, but instead, what I actually want is an infrared pass filter. That is, remove all of the visible light that the camera would see and, and just show the, uh, the infrared light. And I installed that into a filter that I was able to easily slide into a microscope. The second is that the professional systems use a, a hood kind of like this uh, to filter out the ambient lighting in the room. Uh, this is kind of big, heavy, and, and, uh, I didn't really want to deal with something like that. Uh, so instead I basically did was just threw a box on top of the microscope. Uh, and it turned out that if I did this, uh, which didn't allow any direct rays to, uh, to hit the, uh, the sample, and I made sure there, that I had the blinds closed, and I didn't have any, uh, halogen or incandescent bulbs on in the room, uh, just LED lighting. That was generally enough to, to get pretty good images. And if I, if I worked at nighttime and I made sure all of the LED lighting was off in the room, uh, I got pretty results. I was pretty happy. And so, you know, maybe this isn't ideal for a high end lab, but at least for proof of concept, kind of demonstrating a lower cost way to do this, I was pretty happy with the results. Uh, so then I did a little bit more uh, microscope characterization. So one open question, for example, is you get these different uh, microscope objectives rated for either infrared or visible light. And I wanted to understand, you know, what, what was the advantage of selecting one of these over the other, especially since these were relatively expensive. Uh, and I, I should say new because uh, the way that I caught these was I found ones that were dented or scratched on eBay, and I said, good enough. And, you know, most professional people probably wouldn't want that either because it looks ugly, but it turns out in most optical systems, you know, a scratch is not as bad as you might think it is. So, so this actually has a giant scratch on it, but for my purposes, uh, it didn't seem to affect the results too much. I, I could not tell you the difference in optical clarity between these. But in any case, uh, what I, what I found was that, um, uh, generally speaking, this one worked, uh, twice as good, uh, as this one. That is, uh, the images were about twice as bright. Uh, there may also be some, uh, other sort of chromatic corrections, you know, around different wavelengths. Uh, but for my purposes, that wasn't that important either. Uh, 
So I think you could get away with something like this if you really had to for some early tests. Um, but if you have this, you, you definitely should use it. Uh, there's also a few other optics in the microscope that uh, I'm able to kind of slide in and out. And so for taking the really sensitive measurements, I would slide those out to just get the absolute most amount of light uh, through the microscope as possible. Uh, okay, so the next thing is, can we, can we do this on a real chip now? So we've kind of theorized that this, is, this might be a working setup. So what I did was I said, okay, one of the easiest things I could do is we've got this ESD diode on uh, this chip. And what I did was I, I drove some current through this ESD diode uh, very carefully, and I observed that, yes, my microscope was able to see, this is not, this is not like a visible light, like you wouldn't see this, but I was actually able to see the current flowing through this ESD diode. And now I'm verifying that, you know, the setup does at least work uh, to some degree. But the current levels here are fairly large, and the, qu the next question was, you know, would this work on a, uh, on the actual logic level, you know, instead of kind of a power level signal? Um, so, so to get maybe a better signal, I had to do a few more, uh, optimizations. And we're gonna, we're gonna see these optimizations a lot, so I wanna spend a brief moment, uh, to kinda explain why they were done and, and how they work. So the first thing I'm doing is called, uh, called dark frame subtraction. And uh, in an ideal sort of production scenario, what I might do is uh, do something like Pearson correlation. Uh, but for kind of ease of access, what I did instead was I said, okay, try to sub take, take a certain state of a chip that we're interested in. So this one over here, for example, uh, what I had done is there was some transistor current flowing through. And I said, make this the new zero state for the image sensor, you know, subtract out what you currently see. And because I didn't do it perfectly, you know, because there's a little bit of noise, we can still see that there's some kind of bright areas here. But before I did that dark frame subtra subtraction, it might have looked something more like this. But then what I did was I said, okay, here's our zero state, and then turn on this transistor here. And now we see this has increased in brightness. So we say, okay, there's a positive correlation there. And then I switched to a different state where we saw a few other bright areas here. So that's a positive correlation. But also note that there's now these dark areas. And what those dark areas mean is that I've gone below what I'd considered the, the noise floor uh, due to my relative measurement. So these should be interpreted as negative correlation. So once again, bright area, uh, positive correlation, dark area, negative correlation. And the, uh, the second thing is that we do histogram equalization. What that basically means is, uh, you know, I don't know what the human eye can see, uh, but, you know, let's, let's say for argument's sake, it's something like an 8-bit uh, color space. Uh, but these cameras are uh, 12 or maybe even 16 bits. So as we want to take a really sensitive measurement, you're not going to be able to see a one uh, value change on a 16-bit uh, sensor. But what I can do is I can uh, multiply those pixel values. And if you do that, you know, you might go from something like this image over here, which in this case is fairly clear. But after multiplying it, we see things like this transistor here is a lot clearer than it was in this image. And especially as we start going really, really sensitive, uh, those enhancements will become really important. So uh, I'm not going to talk too much more about this, but just know that these sort of enhancements are being done through a lot of the images to varying degrees uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, okay, so let's, let's look at a real chip now. So what I'm going to do is say we've got some sort of uh, basic logic chip here, and uh, we don't need to know uh, how the transistors exactly work, but we do need to know kind of a little bit of a schematic level sort of idea of how these chips might work. So let's say that this is a bipolar logic that we can tell through some uh, sort of guess. And um, we're going to kind of assume that there are some standard ways that at a schematic level, uh, people might design these chips. And uh, other than that, you know, we're not really going to do a lot of, um, you know, logic reverse engineering. It's just going to be based on correlation analysis. You know, what sort of input stimulus do we, do we put in? And uh, how do we observe the transistor switching? Okay. So the first thing you might say is let's let's just get this um, narrow this down a little bit. So if we had looked and squinted a little bit at that die, we would see that it was basically four of the same circuit repeated. So we're just going to focus on one corner of that and just assume that this would apply uh, to the rest of the chip as well. And then maybe based on the circuit board this was from or some other assumptions, uh, we can roughly know that. It has a few input pins and one output pin. And we're going to represent that as this black box over here. So we have uh, two inputs, one output, 
and some uh, power pins. And then what we're going to try to do is figure out what's in between here by doing this sort of emission analysis instead of looking at the gate level. And so the first thing is, let's take a look at the output stage. And so we uh, provide some stimulus. And, uh, and a lot of this sort of uh, TTL bipolar logic, you have an output stage that looks something like this. Uh, so you've got uh, two complementary transistors. They call this a totem pole arrangement. And uh, you, you may either have one of this on or this one on, depending on the logic state you want to represent. So for example, if you want to have a zero on the output, you'll activate Q4, uh, which will basically drive the output to zero. And essentially, if you want a one out there, uh, you'll instead activate Q3 and Q4 will be off. So now if we take uh, photographs of that, so what I did was I started from uh, Z meaning high impedance. I started with nothing connected on the output. And I, I said, okay, let's take a reference of what, how is the chip operating in this state based on the infrared emissions. And then I said, okay, uh, now add additional resistance. And what that's going to do is that's going to increase the current consumption on the output drivers of the chip. And if we do that, we see these two little uh, you know, blobs do uh, illuminate here. And similarly, if we had kind of a low output state, and we do the same thing where we increase the current and do correlation, we see this little blob right here. Now, if we look back to kind of this kind of standard sort of totem pole arrangement, we see two semiconductor devices here, Q3 and D4, which we might guess are these guys over here. And one thing for Q4 for the, um, the low output state, we see one large uh, sort of uh, uh, correlation there. So we can make a pretty good guess that this, these are roughly correspond to the components we see over here. Uh, okay, so, so that was like a first order check. Now, now let's start looking at the inputs a little bit. Uh, it's very common on these chips to have uh, ESD diodes. And so uh, what I did was I said, okay, Let's assume that there's an ESD diode on each one of these inputs, and um, let's try to... Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, let's do the transistor first, actually. So we've got the transistor, and uh, what we're going to do is put a little bit of current into each input and do a similar test. So we had it not connected before, and then we're going to kind of drive the output low, because this is kind of a standard arrangement we see on these. And uh, what we saw was that roughly the same area got some current on the chip, uh, so, you know, maybe the, the base of the transistor. And then we saw that there was the same sort of negative uh, correlation uh, as we activated that transistor. So this is important because it means that these two uh, might be tied together to the same transistor because they had roughly the same effect. Uh, so let's just think about that for a second and just kind of assume that those are, are tied together at some level. And then the second bit, which I alluded to uh, earlier, was those input diodes. So we drive a small negative current through those. And if we do that to each diode, we can actually figure out where those are on the chip. And so that's basically this area right here and this area right here uh, we've kind of identified now as our ESD diodes. Uh, once again, just by uh, observation, not by looking at how the logic might actually work. Okay, so now, now let's actually start cycling through some of the logic states and see how things change. So if we take these two inputs uh, and we drive them low and we see kind of a high output, we get this. And then if we, if we start permuting through the different inputs, we get these states. Now the very interesting thing though is if we put both inputs high, we see a drastic change in how the, how the circuit operates. So this is rather interesting. Uh, and we see we can also take a look based on our earlier observations about you know, what this high-low state was. Um, so if we, court, if we uh, put that into a table, uh, we see that, okay, if input 1 and input 2 are low, low, we get output high. And if we tabulate this, we see we get this table here. Uh, and we got this black box here. So from kind of your, your logic classes you might have taken or something, what is this a truth table for? Does anyone know what, what gate this is? What's that? NAND gate. Perfect. So this is a two-input NAND gate. And so now if we, if we uh, cheat a little bit and we look up uh, what the data sheet might have for something like this, uh, this is what we get. And I've kind of annotated uh, the transistors over here. Uh, over here. And uh, one of the things that I think is really nice about this sort of analysis is notice that we never really talked about Q2. You know, that was kind of an internal state in this. And it just was kind of an implementation detail. Uh, but because all we wanted to do was correlate the input and the output,
and never really came up in the analysis, at least to a major degree. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that's very interesting. So, you know, if you had buffers, for example, inverters, you know, those just kind of fall out from this sort of analysis and you don't even have to worry about them too much. So, so anyway, so yeah, so this is a very basic chip. So, so the next question was, uh, could we scale this up to something a little bit more complicated? And, um, so what if we took something like a four bit counter? Uh, so this is also worth mentioning that if you're, uh, 7400 series uh, knowledgeable. Uh, the very first one I did was a, a pure 7400 series, which is uh, fairly high current. And then I've now moved to the LS series, which is also a little bit lower current. And this was also to demonstrate, you know, the effects of starting to move down in the current flowing through these transistors. And so the question is, could we actually see this counting visually? And uh, so I'm going to try to pull up a video now. So if I can, I'll uh, tab over. And so we see the uh, chip here, the uh, layout. And then I'm going to hit play. And we start seeing the, the states actually counting up. And uh, if you were to do some sort of uh, correlation analysis there, uh, you should be able to... If I get this back up now, I think this is close enough. Uh, give me just a second to get this back up. But if you were to actually do some more formal uh, correlation analysis, uh, you could, you know, even start looking at how the internal states worked and such. Give me just a moment. Okay, perfect. So, so that was that was pretty good because now we've demonstrated at least at a proof of concept level that we're we're able to see these internal logic states too. Because one of the concerns with something as simple simple as that uh, NAND gate that we were just looking at these large current input and output drivers. But in these images, you know, we're able to see plenty of internal logic. And if we started playing with things like, you know, how, how does the up-down mode work and all that sort of stuff, we could actually do correlation analysis and figure out which parts of the circuit were specifically responsible for that. Uh, okay, so going back to kind of why I was interested in this project in the first place. So it turns out that my, my original interest in this was actually not to look at, um, not to look at logic uh, specifically, but actually to floor plan IC. So uh, what I was interested in doing was um, if you said, hey, you know, activate just the timer circuit, you know, where, where does this light up on the chip? And if you activated the ALU, where does this light up on the chip? Because uh, while this, you know, logic level reverse engineering is very powerful, it can be relatively expensive. And so I wanted a way to kind of triage the chip and narrow down to, to where on the chip we actually care about. And one that nice property about this too is that although the feature size on the things that we're looking at now is pretty large, uh, if you're just doing the floor planning and you don't want to actually look at individual transistors, this should mean that it could scale up to modern chips as well. Uh, and I think that's uh, one very interesting property. Uh, but I tried this, and at least uh, for my brief test on this chip, I wasn't able to get a sensitive enough measurement to, to actually see the states. Um, but uh, the main focus was finishing up uh, at least the proof of concept, at least for this phase. And so this is something I'll look at a little bit more carefully in the near future. Uh, the other thing that I looked at was uh, CMOS logic. And basically, we're moving lower and lower in power. Uh, so whereas the uh, bipolar logic that we looked at previously, uh, it just inherently has a lot of resistors and current flowing. Uh, this previous chip, the, um, the 8751, uh, is an NMOS process, so it's got a little bit of power draw, uh, but not as much as the, uh, the bipolar logic. And then by the time you get to CMOS, you really don't have any resistors at all. So this is... This is likely going to be the, the hardest uh, to work on. And uh, so one way you can get more power, because you basically want to spend as much time switching as possible, is to raise the clock frequency. And one practical difficulty I had here was I didn't have a very good signal generator, and uh, I need to do some tests where I really start driving this thing closer to its limit. And if I do that, I suspect that I might start seeing something more interesting. Uh, but I did see you know some of the basic ESD currents, uh, as kind of alluded to earlier. Uh, so another part of this project was if you start looking at um, switch gear, switching gears a little bit, as you, you look into this sort of analysis, you hear backside analysis mentioned a lot. 
So I also wanted to explore this briefly to see, um, you know, what does it look like to do this sort of analysis? And the basic idea is that especially on a, a newer chip, you might have a lot of metal, uh, you know, interconnect that is blocking your view to the transistors. And uh, if you get so much metal there, you won't actually be able to see the transistors switching. So what they do instead is they take advantage of the fact that uh, silicon is roughly transparent around where it starts to uh, emit infrared light. And so if you flip the chip over and you look through the back, you theoretically can see the transistor switching. The one caveat, though, is that there's a fair bit of attenuation through the silicon and scattering. So you want to thin the dye as much as possible to get the best signal possible. And whereas a typical dye might be somewhere in the 200 to 350 uh, micrometer range, you know, maybe an iPhone CPU is, is thin to be on the, the lower end of that. Uh, you know, the chip that I'm going to experiment with here a little bit is about 320 micrometers. You really want to get something more in the 25 micrometer range. So we're, we're talking about an order of magnitude reduction in the uh, sample thickness. Okay, so the first thing I needed to do was I needed a way to look at this and say, hey, can we actually see, can we see through this? Uh, and what I mean is, uh, do we know where we're, we're pointed at on the chip to even try to do this as the emission analysis? And so instead of looking for the light emitted by the chip, I'm intentionally illuminating it with infrared light that I believe should be relatively uh, transparent to the silicon. And so I built this uh, custom uh, illuminator. So instead of visible light, uh, this emits infrared light and can actually see through the silicon. And so I could run a few different tests. I also built them in a few different wavelengths. And we'll see this in a, in a few of the next slides. Uh, and then the next thing is I said, okay, I need to know how far have we polished through the chip? Because the issue is that, um, you know, we, we don't have just a dye. We've got a dye plus a package. And that package is some unknown thickness and maybe a regular. So I wanted a way to actually measure how far we had polished through the chip. Uh, ground through, you know, to thin it out. And so what I found was that if I, if I use my infrared illuminator to look through the chip and I measured the thicknesses using my microscope after polishing them down to, to various thicknesses, uh, I found that uh, roughly speaking, at least on my setup, I got about for every micrometer I focus, cause you know, there's some optics here that are changing the, uh, linearity. Uh, every micrometer focused through the chip was about five micrometers of actual thickness. So now I have a way to, to actually ver uh, verify what the thickness is, uh, even if it's still Im embedded in uh, a larger chip. Uh, yeah. So after that, what I said was, okay, now I'm going to try to take something easy to, to try back thinning on. And uh, I alluded to earlier that I liked these uh, 7805s. You know, they're very readily available uh, and kind of easy to work with. So uh, in particular, too, one of my concerns was that on how, like, say, a dip pick, uh, dip package uh, puts its bond wires, uh, I was afraid that the way that those are packaged, that I might start grinding through bond wires. But on a TO220, uh, the die is on the very back, and the leads are, are closer to the center of the package. And what this means is I can actually grind quite a bit back here without any fear of messing up the pins uh, on this chip. Uh, and they're also not very expensive. So you see I've opened up one from the uh, front side here just to kind of show what it looks like and run some early tests. But ultimately, we're going to flip this over and we're going to grind through the back side of the chip uh, to kind of expose these transistors from the other side. And uh, I started doing uh, kind of a CNC milling to do this with, uh, or I should say grinding. Uh, I did try milling, but it just completely like destroyed the chip. So no go. Uh, but grinding seemed to work pretty good, except uh, by taking some resistance measurements on the pins and running other tests, I got convinced that I was actually, maybe due to the shaking or something like that, I was actually knocking the pins off internally, and they just stopped working. And a few other kind of odd behaviors. Um, so I wasn't really sure what was going on, so I tried a different strategy, which is I went to just hand sanding. And uh, although hand sanding isn't terribly even, what I was able to do was use, uh, take advantage that I, I kind of had a rough idea of what the, the initial thickness was and make an assumption that it was relatively even throughout the part. And by, by taking this uh, micrometer and kind of measuring the corners, I could see how evenly I was thinning it down and make adjustments if I, if I favored one side too strongly. And this seemed to work pretty well. I was able to get, without too much effort, I was able to pretty easily get something that was 10 micrometers uh, across even uh, planarity, 
And I think if I was a little bit careful, I, I should be able to get that below five, which I think for hand sanding was, uh, was not too bad. Uh, and then so, so after doing this, uh, I was having some problems. And in fact, one of the chips even kind of blew up on me. Uh, so this kind of showed, okay, it wasn't just the shaking from the, the milling machine. Uh, there was something else going on. And I think what I, what I found was I made some bad assumptions. When I thought about, you know, how thick of a transistor was, uh, I had said, okay, you know, there's a large substrate on this chip. We don't really need the lar large substrate. But it seemed, at least based on some empirical evidence, uh, that, you know, it actually needed to be fairly deep. And at least on this 7805, I think it had to be in the ballpark of 25 micrometers thick for the chip to even really function uh, reasonably and reliably. Uh, so I think there may have been some shaking in the milling machine, but the really the larger issue was I was just thinning them too much. Um, okay, so, so now I just knew that don't thin so much, and maybe these chips will survive. Uh, so I did that, and uh, what I basically found, and these, these two images aren't A, B, uh, but on the left is a front side image, and the, the right is a back side image. And at least to some degree, you can see, for example, we've lost, uh, we've lost one of these dots. And because this is front and back, we have kind of a, a mirror image here. And you can barely, barely see that. I don't even know if you, you can see it over there. But you can see a little bit of this guy, uh, but it's, it's basically gone. And when I did a kind of a, a more fair test where I, where I calibrated the exposure times and getting the same brightness, I found that I, at least with my sample chip, which was, I think, in the 30 micrometer roughly range, uh, it, it was about an 18 times uh, brightness difference. And I think if I thin this a little bit more, I might have been able to go to 20, maybe 25 micrometers. I, I think that that would improve a little bit, but fundamentally, we would probably see a lot more attenuation on the front side. So at least for the tests that I'm doing now, I, I don't have any specific need to go to the back side. I'm not looking at very dense uh, chips. And so with the additional effort of doing the backside analysis, uh, the attenuation I'm seeing, uh, there really was no need to do more backside analysis. And I just focused on the, uh, the front side. Uh, I did try br briefly one other thing, which was to um, try chemical thinning. Uh, there's uh, various solutions you can use, uh, potassium hydroxide, uh, TMAH. Uh, I tried this, and uh, it seemed to work decently good. I don't really have a scale here, but... Um, uh, one, one thing to note though is that typically, uh, in semiconductor facilities, you know, you're, you're maybe thinning, you know, a couple of micrometers. Uh, I'm thinning 300 micrometers. So, you know, the sort of, um, planarity I need is a lot higher, arguably, than you might need in, uh, like a fab or something like this. So I think this has some potential, uh, but ultimately because I've abandoned backside, uh, I'm not going to think about this too much right now. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is you get these sort of slopes as you do this. Uh, so that potentially could cause some issues depending on uh, the type of analysis you were running. Uh, another alternative sort of uh, technique I tried was using these uh, in-gas uh, photodiodes. Although the, uh, the whole cameras are rather expensive, you can get individual uh, sensors for not too much. Uh, unfortunately, the unit I got, um, I think there's something wrong with it. Uh, like the, the clicker on the back isn't really working that well. There's some, you know, kind of levels that, that seem kind of off. It does respond to light, uh, but um, I don't know. In any case, if I switched on these chips, even with relatively high current levels, I really couldn't see any, any changes at all on these, uh, on these uh, sensors, even using a very sensitive uh, meter. Uh, so maybe something to try in the future. I've heard others getting good results, but they had more uh, purpose-built setups. And it may be that, that I would need to do something more purpose-built to really get good results. Uh, I also tried this, uh, this thing. I don't know exactly what these are called, but I think they're intended for, uh, like, if you have a laser lab and you want to see where the beam is in the lab. Uh, I don't know if they're an intensifier tube or exactly, but you kind of look through them. And even when the device is off, you can kind of see the room. Uh, but um, if you turn it on, it kind of enhances the infrared light. And so when I switch this thing on, I'm able to see the, um, the diodes and uh, operating, like if I use my infrared illuminator. Uh, however, when I pointed at a microscope or the chip itself, I wasn't able to see anything at all. However, I uh, was able to... Oops, it didn't click this time. Uh, I was able to... I was just manually... I was able to uh, use some uh, night vision goggles because I said, okay, what else is a really sensitive camera? Uh, 
And, you know, these things are designed for operating in really, really low light levels. And I 3D printed a, uh, an adapter to fit on the microscope. And uh, much to my surprise, uh, this actually worked surprisingly well. So you can see a video, you see the uh, transistors just turned on in the upper right-hand corner, and then you see a faint glow of them as they've kind of reached steady state. Uh, so while that looks like it may not be as uh, high contrast as some of the other images, you have to realize, you know, we, we were pinning this against, you know, maybe 15-second exposures, you know, for some of those images, maybe a little bit less for this chip. Uh, but this thing is running at many frames per second. Uh, and so I think with a little bit better camera mounting, maybe some better game, c game control, because uh, that's also an issue, I think this is oversaturating, I think this has some pretty interesting potential. The main downside is that these are fairly expensive compared to the uh, other cameras. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how, how plausible this is in the long run. Uh, another thing I tried was looking at uh, implant ROMs. Uh, I heard that... Um, that uh, these ROMs, which have very small doping differences, uh, they change their response to infrared light uh, depending on um, whether it was a 1 or a 0. And the idea is you could use this to do a firmware extraction on certain chips. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't see any differences, uh, at least with some quick tests I did. You see I've got a little LED down here, which is basically shining through a chip up there. Uh, but I'd like to revisit this, try, try 1060 and, and a few other tests, um, but no results so far at least. Uh, last things is, uh, kind of alluded to earlier, but I'm going to try to do this, uh, 8751 and see if I can actually start identifying the parts on the chip just based on the emissions. Uh, I would like to do, uh, CMOS, uh, at some point to, to target more modern chips. And the last thing I kind of alluded to earlier is there's an alternative technique, at least one you can try to do, uh, for this called, uh, voltage contrast imaging, where you use a scanning electron microscope, uh, to, uh, put um, uh, voltage through the chip, and uh, you can actually see, depending on the voltage, it'll deflect the electron beam, and you're able to read out some of the uh, circuits operating. So at some point, I'd like to explore that as kind of a related uh, alternative technique. Uh, so that's, uh, that's basically uh, what I got. So um, I basically would say that, you know, cooled CCDs or the back illuminated CMOS seem to give uh, good results for at least uh, basic logic chips. Uh, however, you should make sure that you pay very close attention to how you calibrate these because it's, they are very sensitive measurements. Uh, I was able to get pretty decent results, I would say, with bipolar logic without, without too much cost. Uh, I think something NMOS like the, uh, 70, uh, 8751 is maybe, uh, plausible, uh, but needs a little bit more research. And I'm a little bit skeptical though due to the much lower power of CMOS, at least with, with the test done so far that you're going to be able to do this with a with a very low cost setup. But of course, I'll try to explore that as I push things further. Uh, and the last is that I wouldn't do backside analysis unless you have a really good reason. Because um, it just it just was a lot harder and didn't give as good a signal. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed. That's uh, that's the material I have. And um, uh, if you if this interests uh, you, feel free to reach out uh, to discuss. And uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, if just on the off chance you're interested in these uh, illuminators, uh, I might do a small run at some point if you're interested in getting one. So thanks for listening, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Do we have questions? So uh, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but you said that the dense metallization causes the IR to not work as well, right? Uh, just simply because uh, you know you just you're shielding it, right? Yeah. So it's just something in the way of getting the infrared light out. But 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 would this mean like for smart card chips that are like shielded and you want an active state out of it, this would become difficult using IR, even if it were like a more expensive setup? Right, but that, then that means that you'd have to do the backside analysis. So so if you have the more expensive analysis. It just means you'd have to thin the back, and then you would uh, point this more sensitive camera at the back. Oh, oh, so like if you mill it down to like 30 or so, and it still worked, the, uh, oh. you think a more like expensive setup would still work? Oh, yes. Oh, I, okay, I believe okay. a more expensive. Most. It's also worth mentioning that uh, I'm not an expert on smart card security, but my understanding is most of them don't have any sort of backside countermeasures. So, okay. All right. Thank you.